So today we're joined by Roz Litsky. She is the Restoration Project Manager for the Save the Redwoods League. She's a part of the Redwoods Rising program and they've been doing amazing work up north. Dylan Skybrook, who's the manager of the Santa Cruz Mountain Stewardship Network, and he's going to be sharing how his network is adapting to COVID. Shalana De Silva, the political director for Together Bay Area, and Kim Carringer, manager of the Environmental Improvement Division with the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. And then lastly, Kevin Wright with the County of Marin. So with that, Roz, I'm going to turn it over to you. Take care. Hi everyone. I'm going to first by actually turning off my video so it doesn't just crash my computer when I start my PowerPoint because um, I like to show some pretty pictures of some of the work that we're doing. And then I'm going to start sharing my screen and hoping that it works for me. So Redwoods Rising is a project located in Northern California, and I wanted to give a little bit of background because I wasn't sure how many folks on the Zoom call today would be familiar with it, but Redwood National and State Park located in Humboldt and Del Norte County is home to 45% of the remaining old growth forests uh, that are, or remaining old growth forests, but also two thirds of the park, about 80,000 acres, um, is a product of some uh, prior land use history related to um, a lot of clear cutting and logging and a lot of like building roads um, throughout the landscape, burying um, sediment, stream channels, and so it's really degraded the environment over time and then prior to becoming a park it was oftentimes reseeded in very dense stands and without active management it's resulted in conditions that you can see in the larger photo where it's got almost like no understory so it doesn't have a lot of resiliency to any types of disturbance it's really dark there's no um, great habitat for all the wonderful wildlife and there's also no recruitment for the next large um, wood that we might want to find um, dumping itself into the many um, stream channels with threatened and endangered species that are located within the watersheds. So building upon the restoration work that Parks has been doing uh, and related to road removal and restoration thinning, Redwoods Rising was born to think about this at like a landscape level. And so we're working in Redwood National Park and three state parks, primarily doing restoration, thinning, road reoccupation and removal, and aquatic restoration. We've got two primary areas that we're starting. One is in Humboldt County, which is about 9,200 acres. And the second is, in, or the next one is in Mill Creek or in um, Del Norte County, and it's about 30,000 acres. And we expect for those activities to take us at least 25 or 30 years, but it's important to know that we intend to um, treat all of the second growth forests. It's just a matter of timing and when and funding. And so it's, um, I think, always important to acknowledge is that there's three major drainages, the Smith, Klamath, and Redwood Creek. But it's also the ancestral territory of three tribal groups, the Tuolumne Dini, Yurok tribe, and Hupa. So how are we going to get all this great work done? Well, we took, uh, since environmental compliance is my background, I have a lot to say on this, but I'm going to try to keep it brief because I think it's re really just important to acknowledge that, one, we're almost done, which feels amazing. Um, and we're working on our pre-implementation reports that we, for the work that we want to accomplish this year. The second thing is that we took a, a programmatic approach. And because we had the benefit of having both a lead and federal entity and the league hiring of a consultant um, that I mainly manage, we were able to get this work done a lot faster than maybe would typically happen. And so we were able to um have like for example on the for the coastal commission instead of getting a coastal permit we were able to use the federal consistency determination process because mps could act as the 
or be as the lead federal agency, they were able to run it through a different part of the program rather than um, getting a permit for each time we wanna do the activity, which I think will be a savings of time overall. The second big one is that we received a master agreement from Cowfish and Wildlife for stream bed alteration agreements. And this was, um, you know, it has an expiration date of, I think, in like 15 years, um, which I think typically they, they run for about five. It was very costly. It cost about a hundred grand. And in some ways we felt like we got a deal because instead of getting a permit for each watershed, we got one for, um, that just includes one. So it was kind of a two for one deal, but yet it was very costly and there will be a yearly renewal fee of about eight grand. Um, so we want to be thought, thoughtful that um, it does give us a lot of flexibility, but, but price is a factor. So the activities that we're proposing for 2020 is restoration thinning of about 920 acres between the watersheds, almost 13 miles of road, replacing a lot of culverts and reoccupying some roads. And we're not proposing any aquatic restoration, but we are gonna be taking some of the trees and root balls and staging them for future efforts. So the big piece of this conversation um, that I wanted to mention was really the summary of achievements um, and what's taken us to this point. And, Gosh, I, I, I'm not sure how to describe the blood, sweat, and tears that go into a project like this and the level of effort and the, the years of in the making to get us to this point. I think there's oftentimes a feeling that we're like, yeah, we're really doing it. Like somehow all of that, you know, planning work that we did didn't quite, um, you know, it's not quite as meaningful because it's not quite as tangible when you can go out and say, go outside and say, hey, that tree's down or, or, you know, focusing on what we're leaving behind versus what we're taking. And so uh, I feel like it's important to just kind of acknowledge that the, the big effort, the big lift that um, people have to see and, and how truly transformative this project is for all the agencies and, and the league that taking work on at this scale, doing it all together, you know, it's a lot. And I think we're, we're starting to see the fruits of our labor. So we have these blended field crews. So instead of having just a purely state park staff working on, or purely MPS staff, you see state parks hiring, uh, you know, forestry aides that are going to work in Redwood National Park. We have league temporary hires. We see that the strengths of all of the organizations really come to fruition. And we're able to, uh, you know, think about these things. I think a, another component of the project that I wanted to highlight was just challenges during COVID and what we're doing and managing to, to keep us moving forward. And I can't say that we're doing anything in particular other than trying to rely upon our foundation that we've built um, and that we're trying to honor the you know, the different organizations um, and where they may be at on particular issues. For example, the league has a policy of no more than one person per vehicle, but that's different than parks. Um, and that extra, um, those extra trucks, you know, mean extra costs and parking and appearance of waste and but trying to work through that open communication about how to address these issues and then also try to address i think the COVID fog burnout that dealing with it just takes extra time that nobody had we knew we knew this year was going to be a hard year we just didn't predict the pandemic and how much more time that was going to take but i think the what what i what, what makes me feel better at night or to be, sleep better with this project is that I think our, our foundation of like, it's always continuing to shift and evolve. And I think that that's just best, best illustrated by like different catchphrases that we use over time. And so at first, when I came onto the project, um, Emily Burns, the former director of science from the league left, and that was a big hole to fill. And Emily and I kind of bantered around the idea, it's just too big to fail. The train has left the station, it's just going. Um, and we are just gonna keep on this and that we are past the point of no return. 
And then we had our kickoff event during the power outages on the North Coast. Um, and so we had the State Parks Director and the Regional Director at the time from MPS show up as well as um, a bunch of people from CAL FIRE and we just coined the term like, well, I guess we'll just figure it out because we just do and we just did. Um, and then now as our first year of restoration thinning, we're termed the phrase maximum flexibility. So we're just trying to give ourselves, um, all of us, like a daily meditation that it's going to be okay. There's huge learning. Like we, you know, there's only so much you can do to get ready to this. So we're also learning about ways that we're going to be more efficient and better do the job next year. So with that, I think it's probably been about eight minutes. I can only see Sharon and maybe Devin. Um, and could you shake your head if I'm at that eight minutes? Because I can always ramble on more, but I want to check in with time. <laughs> You're not rambling, Roz. There's a lot that the project has accomplished. I mean, I remember when Victor and Steve were at one of our early network meetings with Jay trying to figure out what this was going to look like, and so much has happened. And for those of you that joined us last fall, Jay gave his impassioned conversation about the importance and value of this type of work. So does anyone have a question for Roz? Um, otherwise, we can move into Dylan uh, joining us from San Mateo, Santa Cruz. All right. Well, Roz, it's amazing to have you join us. It's been phenomenal watching the progress and hopefully we'll have a field trip sometime in the near future. So moving south uh, down to the Santa Cruz region, uh, Dylan Skybrook, was, uh, who is the coordinator for the Santa Cruz Mountain Stewardship Network, um, he is going to share things uh, that are happening in that network, how they're adapting to COVID and what's new that we can learn from. Okay, thanks Sharon. Hi everybody, I'm Dylan Skybrook and as Sharon said, I manage the Santa Cruz Mountain Stewardship Network. Uh, the network uh, covers the Santa Cruz Mountains, which is the range just south of San Francisco. Um, We're in San Mateo County, Santa Cruz County, and part of Santa Clara County. Um, we've amazingly been able to do quite a few things during pandemic. Um, other things, of course, are on hold, um, but a lot uh, still going on. One of our big projects is we're doing um, a veg map for Santa Cruz and Santa Clara County, and we're building on um, projects that happened already in Marin and San Mateo and Sonoma. And we're really lucky to be able to do, in the, do this project with um, Danny Franco, who works with the Golden Gate Parks Conservancy and has worked on those other projects, and Cass Green, who is uh, acting as a technical advisor for the project. And she also worked on those other projects. Um, this list here, you can see some of the data products that we're uh, going to be getting uh, for this project, LIDAR and ortho imagery and et cetera. One of the exciting things is Cal Fire gave us a grant to um, do some fuels mapping to help them figure out where they can uh, do fuels reductions to avoid catastrophic wildfire. Um, and then at the bottom there, you can see that we're still looking for funds for the um, actual fine scale veg map for every part of the region. And uh, as I'm sure has happened for many of you, uh, we were going along pretty well until COVID hit and that really uh, put, a, put a wrench in the gears in terms of funding. So we've raised about two and a half million dollars for this project and still looking for $800,000. Um, but still, even what will come out of it is, is pretty exciting. Um, uh, yeah, so another project we have going on we have an Atlas project in which we were able to get funding for um, a postdoc working out of Stanford to create an Atlas that would help all the members of our network uh, do landscape stewardship together. So, you know, what are the layers that they would need um, to, help to cooperate and collaborate across property lines and jurisdictions and so on. Um, in addition to a lot of other layers that you might expect, uh, Kelly, who is the postdoc working on this project, she's created an amazing trails map for the region. We're going to do a stewardship layer in which she has down uh, who owns what and what are they doing on the property. You know, where's grazing, where's timber, etc. So we can see that across the region. And she's also doing a health assessment as well. 
We also have a fire and forest health team that's going pretty strong right now. Um, you know, looking at all the issues that affect everyone around uh, fire and forest health across the region. And we're working with, uh, that group is working with the regional prioritization group um, that the governor put together. There's several, several of these regional groups around the state um, coming up with projects that should happen to enhance forest health and decrease the risk of catastrophic wildfire and so on. And that's been a really exciting project. Also still going on for us is uh, permitting. Um, and this is kind of interesting because we originally started this permitting team a few years ago, um, working on permitting streamlining for the region. And that work got picked up by this network, the California Landscape Stewardship Network, and then picked up by Secretary Crowfoot and is uh, fed into uh, being the Cutting the Green Tape initiative, which is pretty exciting that this sort of seed started in our network and kept moving forward and, and having its own life. So back in our region, we've been getting more granular and thinking about what's useful for this team to do in our region. And right now we have Cleopatra Tude from the San Mateo RCD um, working on a study that it looks at the possibility of a regionally coordinated effort for the recovery of San Francisco garter snake and what that would mean permitting wise. Uh, because most of the permits are piecemeal about you know specific organizations and their properties and so on. So what would it be like to have uh, permitting that crosses all those boundaries and so on? Um, that actually is about to come out. I'm hoping to get a look at it this week or next. So uh, that's exciting. Uh, we also have a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee that's going uh, strong right now. Still, um, it's been a wild time to be engaging in those questions. Um, that committee has really been about even figuring out what there is to do about this specific to our region and the field of land management and so on. Um, there's been a lot of learning together, a lot of sharing of resources and, and, and so on. Um, we, you know, one of the things that is frustrating about COVID amongst, you know, in addition to everything, is that there are fewer events that we're able to do and so much the network is about events. Um, so we've done a few of our convenings that are usually in person um, on Zoom. And those have been very useful, but I have to say not as generative as usual. Um, usually the, just the act of being together in the same room, you know, having coffee breaks, all that stuff creates qu quite a lot of activity. And of course, that's just not happening in the same way. On the other hand, we just did our first uh, Zoom salon. We have this uh, series of salon events in which we get our members together to talk about different things that are important to them. We've done salons on mountain biking and on restoration forestry and grazing. We did one on epic fails because everyone always likes to talk about their successes and no one wants to talk about their failures. That was a good one, that was deep. Uh, but the one that we just did was our first Zoom salon uh, was on uh, predator conflicts, specifically on uh, mountain lions. And that was great, that went, it went really well. We had a really amazing uh, panel. We had Matt Sharp Cheney from Midpen we had Chris Wilmers, who runs the Puma Project out of UCSC. We had Justin Dellinger, the uh, mountain lion and gray wolf researcher from CDFW. And Carolyn Whitesell, who's a human wildlife conflict advisor at UC Cooperative Extension. And we had a really amazing conversation, lots of good information, and really interestingly, pretty much the exact number of people we usually have in person. Uh, not more, not less, like exactly <laughs> how it usually goes. Uh, so that was great. Um, our next salon will be in September on bullfrog management. So we'll see how that one goes. Um, in terms of COVID, we've been having a lot of calls together as a network on um, how people are doing relative to COVID. We've had calls on what is essential work um, you know, back especially early in the, in the crisis and, you know, how do you decide whether to send your people out to do whatever activity? Uh, we've had calls on public access for all the people who are trying to figure out whether they're going to close their 
parks or preserves or close their bathrooms or open the bathrooms back up or all these different kind of decisions that everyone's had to make. Um, and then we had, have had calls on finances. How's everyone dealing with um, the difficulty in finances and plans for recovery and so on. And all those calls have been really useful um, for people to be able to share information or at the very least uh, to be able to um, just contextualize themselves to see what other people are doing or what's happening to other people and so on. So those have been have been quite valuable. Um, a new thing we're doing is we're going to start a policy education team um, that'll meet first in maybe a week or two. Um, our network does not lobby. There's too many of us to agree on what we would lobby for. Um, but we did figure it would be a good idea to have a team that would be in place to educate everybody on relevant pieces of legislation uh, and to help lead conversation around those things. So that'll be exciting to see uh, what that team does. And of course, finally, some of our things are on hold. We've got climate change scenario planning workshops and diversity, equity, and inclusion workshops that we're still holding out um, to try and do those in person if that's ever possible again. And of course, some of our discussions have gone by the wayside. An example of that is that um, we, uh, we were coordinating on a response to PG&E regarding how they are doing their work on our members' land. It's not always great. Um, so that has just fallen by the wayside as everyone is still in emergency mode. But so all of these things will pick up as um, the members have the energy and attention to deal with them and um, as we're able to do things in person and that kind of thing. So that's, that's the quick snapshot of where we've been in the past couple of months. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thanks, Devin. I think you, I mean, Dylan, you generated quite a conversation with your epic fails. I think we have a new happy hour theme. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, I'm serious, that one went deep. We got deep, you guys. It was good. It was a good conversation. I highly recommend, uh, you know, repeating that one in, a, in another venue. You also speak to a lot about the power of a network, right? I mean, the number of themes that are, that are crossing everyone's organization, agencies, funding, projects slowing down, I mean, all those things. So it sounds like you found a good rhythm to bring those conversations forward. Well, you know, Sharon, one of the things that I've been pleased with is how much is still happening. I think it speaks to the necessity of the network and the health of our specific network that there's all this stuff that still wants to happen, all these connections that still want to be made, even though people are not able to get together in the way that they usually are. Oh, thank you. Well, we'll have, we'll hear more from Dylan as we uh, move forward. And next we have uh, Shalana De Silva. And, you know, this has been a really interesting evolution to watch the formation of Together Bay Area. We have a number of coalitions that have evolved over the course of the, you know, short life of the network. And Shalana is going to share some, I think, really exciting data and a synopsis of some of the work that they've been doing as they look at economic stimulus. So Shalana, I'll turn thank it over you. to you. Thank you, Sharon. Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see all of you. Um, I'm Shalana De Silva, the political director with Together Bay Area, which I will tell you about in just a moment. I'm going to take a cue from my friend Roz, though, and turn off my video um, and then start sharing my screen. So just give me one moment, please, while I do that. Okay. Hopefully you can see this now. We can. Yes. Okay, great. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, I wanted to take a moment to just present to you our, our recent project that Together Bay Area has undertaken, which is our Bay Area Lands, People, and Economy Green Stimulus Report. Um, Together Bay Area stands on the shoulders of the 30-year-old Bay Area Open Space Council, um, but as Sharon mentioned, this is a new coalition with a new vision and a new mission. Um, we're a regional coalition of public agencies, tribes, and nonprofits, and we are really approaching our work through the twin lenses of climate resilient lands and social equity. Um, we felt that, that those two approaches are really critical for answering the problems of the 21st century that we face even pre-COVID. 
Um, and when we talk about lands, we're inclusive of lands that are working, rural, urban, private lands, and public lands. So we stand as the champion and regional voice of the resilient lands and waters that are integral to a thriving Bay Area and all people who live here and visit. I want to just flash this uh, screen up really quickly. This is a, a list of our members. Um, we have 59 members currently, and I want to thank our members. There are a few of them who are on this Zoom call with us right now, and um, it is their contributions to our coalition that make the work that we do possible. So our jobs report. Um, the impetus for this was really, you know, a couple of weeks after the shelter in place order um, came about in the Bay Area. I was really just caught up by the fact that um, our public lands and working lands are serving as really critical COVID response in this moment. Um, the accessibility and health of those lands seems more important than ever today in the context of COVID, the climate crisis, and of course our crashing economy as well. And yet we know that our business models, at least for the members of our coalition, um, are, are dependent on periodic capital fund sources and the availability of that ongoing funding source. And with the crashing economy, we saw that um, we were in a very fragile state. Um, and so we really wanted to take a proactive look at this idea of a Green New Deal, which has gotten a lot of airtime, as we know, over the last several months, even prior to COVID. Proof of concept is obvious for those of us working in this field because we are constantly designing projects and hiring people and addressing climate change and making public lands more accessible. And we understand really intrinsically how that all of that activity um, generates uh, a, a local, regional, and even eventually statewide economy. Um, but we wanted to make this really explicit for our state leaders in this moment. We knew that um, the state was very overwhelmed, obviously, um, trying to respond to the pandemic crisis, as well as the economy, balance a budget. Um, and so we felt that by representing the data, the jobs data that is specific to the work and project and programs of our members, we would be able to make this proof of concept really clear to elected leaders that there's in this crisis, a moment of opportunity for us to begin to address a number of issues at once. So in order to move quickly, um, we wanted to design a very simple survey. We sent this out to all at the time 56 of our members and we got responses from about 24 members. And our policy committee um, was really critical in analyzing the data and helping to report out um, on what we found. These are the guiding principles that we use to kind of share our findings with uh, elected leaders. We're really centering the voices and needs of under-resourced communities and as well centering the idea of a nature-based solution, suite of solutions to some of the climate problems that we're facing today. Um, and as well to um, provide a pathway towards economic resiliency by creating jobs that are addressing public access issues, climate threats like wildfire and floods, et cetera. And we're basically encouraging state leaders to invest in the type of work that we do, that our members do, in order to provide the multiple benefits um, to communities and as well as the economy. Um, we really critically uh, wanting to look at permitting inefficiencies and costs and time delays. And so we also really wanted to put in front of leaders that there, this is a moment to be innovative and bold and help advance initiatives like cutting green tape. Um, we saw that out of the uh, projects that were surveyed um, from our membership that a number of them, in fact, more than half of them would benefit from um, increased um, efficiencies in permitting. And then we're basically saying that what our data shows is that an integrated climate adaptation goal that has an economic development approach and prioritizes the needs of under-resourced communities can actually work and start to build us a path back towards economic resiliency. So by the numbers, this is basically the synopsis of the findings. These are considered conservative estimates. As you saw at the beginning, you know, not our entire coalition did not um, provide data. So we feel really comfortable saying that this is at the, at the sort of minimum what our region can do. 10,500 jobs. For the purpose of this survey, we were really calling jobs anything that is um, part-time, full-time, seasonal, or contractor. We wanted to be really simple because as many of you know, as you start to do economic analyses, it can get very complex. I'm not an economist. So we wanted to just say, these are the projects that we have. 
these are the number of jobs that are associated with them. And as you can see, for one 10 county region, that's a lot of jobs. Um, those jobs are associated with 620 unique projects. These projects cover all nine counties that touch uh, the Bay as well as Santa Cruz County. And 7.7 .7 million, that's the total population of the Bay Area region, the people who would benefit um, from the clean air, water, and access to nature that these projects provide. So what does it all mean? Essentially, what we found is that parks, public lands, and working lands are COVID response. And that an integrated approach to funding those types of projects um, while looking at climate change, while prioritizing the you know, vulnerable communities who are most impacted by climate threats, the pandemic itself, and jobs loss, that by integrating those approaches, we could actually build a path back towards uh, socioeconomic and climate resiliency. There is a lot of urgent stewardship work that we need to do, and we know that parks and public lands are standing as an essential service in this moment. Um, and so what we found is that by investing in our business models, we can actually achieve um, some, of, some of the goals that we have under the state's strategic climate change goal, but also, um, again, begin to, begin to put people back to work. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. If I can figure that out, there we go. So Shalana, have you received much feedback from some of your early engagement with state leaders or uh, elected officials? Yes, um, there are a number of members of the Bay Area Caucus who were really interested in this data. To be honest with all of you, um, what we found is that there was a lot of activity around a potential climate resilience bond um, that had, was taking up some bandwidth of, uh, for elected leaders. Um, but frankly, balancing the budget um, interfacing with Congress around future federal stimulus was reasonably and understandably taking up uh, a lot of bandwidth for our elected leaders. I just saw today um, that Assemblymember Tang um, has, who chairs the Bay Area Caucus, is putting out a proposal for economic stimulus that is integrating a number of different appro approaches that have been talked about. And so our hope is that we're going to see a little bit more bandwidth and capacity for state leaders to engage more thoughtfully in uh, specific actions that the state can take uh, to provide green stimulus to our economy. And so we're hoping to leverage this data in those conversations ongoing. Well, great. Please let us know how we can help. And again, if there are other regions that have data that we can kind of add to and further leverage what you've already done, um, please let us know. We're happy to connect folks. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. That's really important too. I think, you know, um, our coalition wants to share with the state is that this is a really um, simple model, that, a simple and yet powerful model that can be re replicated in, in any region of the state. And we're here to help with that too. Thank you. Great. As you can see, we've got everything from projects to how networks operate during a time of COVID to how coalitions can leverage ways in which we should be investing our resources and our economic engine and stewardship. And uh, now we're gonna go to Lake Tahoe and uh, connect with Kim, who's going to, Kim Carringer is going to give us an update about what they're doing. They've, they've had an interesting time. There's definitely been a lot of tourism in Tahoe, and I think they've been struggling to balance how to respond to that in the midst of COVID. So Kim, I'm going to turn it over to you. Perfect. Can you see my screen and hear me? Yes and yes. Um, you're exactly right, Shan or Sharon, hold on. I think I might also take a cue and turn my camera off because it gets slow, right? Uh, one second, can I do that? It's okay, after Dylan's described epic fails, you've got all sorts of friendly faces here watching what's ever gonna happen. <laughs> I know, that's true. Okay, stop video. Okay, that's just easier that way. Okay, so yeah, you're exactly right, Sharon. Um, here in Tahoe, we are facing, honestly, record tourism right now, and I am gonna talk about that in my presentation. I'm gonna cover the Lake Tahoe Environmental Improvement Program, really um, give a brief overview, some accomplishments we've had over the last year, and then I'll, I'll touch on the sustainable recreation piece at the end. And so for those of you that aren't familiar with the Lake Tahoe EIP, 
Um, we break it into four different focus areas and, and basically the Lake Tahoe Environmental Improvement Program is Lake Tahoe's restoration program. It's been going on for 23 years now. It started in 1997 when we started to see a huge decline in clarity, losing at average like a foot of a year in Lake Tahoe. So back then we were able to bring the partnership together of agencies across both state lines and across all of the many jurisdictions that this watershed covers and really come together to create an action plan to restore the full watershed. Um, now we have over 80 partners um, participating in the EIP today, hundreds of projects under our belts. And I will just touch on a couple that we've um, finished over the last year. And again, I won't, I, what one, one program does with 80 partners in a year is really um, astounding sometimes. So it's hard to pick sometimes, but I'm just gonna cover a couple. But watersheds and water quality focus area is really the foundation of the program where we really started focusing on restoring the watershed um, impacts from development, impacts from recreation and improving our water quality and lake clarity. Forest health is also a main focus area, um, restoring the resilience of our watersheds, reducing hazardous fuels. Sustainable recreation and transportation really focuses on how we get people around Lake Tahoe, improving the visitor experience, improving public access. And then science, stewardship and accountability is kind of the support of all of those, having our projects based on best available science, getting people and the private community really involved and holding ourselves accountable to all the goals and we've set or in all the public funds we're utilizing. So I'll, I'll give a highlight basically in each area under watersheds and water quality, we have our stormwater management program. And this is really the local jurisdictions bread and butter. We've set targets for each local jurisdiction to reduce the flow of fine sediment into the lake from roads and different developed parcels around the lake. And they continue to exceed targets. 2019 is no different. You can see kind of the trend line here of thousands from going to the lake, which has slowly improved our clarity and averted clarity loss over time. Uh, a highlight in a watershed restoration program. This is an example of one that was just completed this last year up on the North Shore on the Nevada side, um, Rosewood and Third Creek restoration. Uh, many of you are familiar with projects like these where before you had old, cul old culverts going underneath the bridge here, which really um, wasn't great for fish, fish passage or um, the delivery of fine sediment into Lake Tahoe. And here you can see a much improved, more naturally restored creek and public access crossing. Uh, next one. We also, this last year, the Fish and Wildlife Service, along with the Nevada Department of Wildlife, were able to release 5,000 Lahontan cutthroat trout into Lake Tahoe this year. Um, this is a native species to Lake Tahoe that we are trying to reintroduce back into the watershed. And this opportunity was held in conjunction with the Fall Fish Festival to really get public excitement about them. And all these were tagged. Um, to see how LCT, we call them, um, utilize the lake, where they go, how they use habitat, and allows for anglers to catch them and report on where they're finding them. Big project also for this year was aquatic invasive species. Um, one of our big projects was the Tahoe Keys. Up there on the right, you can see this is a private development that's linked to Lake Tahoe, 1,592 homes in here. And it's pretty much 100% infested with aquatic invasive weeds, particularly Eurasian water milfoil. And we just completed an extensive environmental study, over 1.5 million data points, an environmental review of options of how to tackle a 172 acre um, infestation of weeds. And uh, controversial at times, there's proposals for potentially using herbicide here, which has never been used in Lake Tahoe. So strong collaboration on that project as they hit this milestone and um, really working with the private community and environmental community on what might be the best option to treat that large infestation. Um, in our community wildfire and protection program, we had a record number of defensible space inspections this year all around the lake. Our local fire 
jurisdictions are really involved with that and got some increased funding this year. Over 5,400, you can see on this graph that we've taken from the EIP tracker of the most so far in a year. And that's done through a lot of public outreach and a lot of increased public interest in fire. We've been very fortunate not to have a catastrophic wildfire there in the last decade. Um, and that's a lot due to our forest restoration program. This forest action plan was recently released and a couple other records that happened over the last year with over 4,600 acres treated in the basin amongst all the jurisdictions. The Forest Service being the biggest one, over 3,000 acres of that with them being the biggest landowner, but a record amount of acres on the California side by both the state parks and the conservancy um, and over 300 acres on private land, which was a record as well. So we do kind of feel we're working against the clock to really restore the forest in Tahoe to avoid those catastrophic events. Uh, transportation, new roundabouts. If you've been to Tahoe recently, you, you'll see this has been on the California side, two new roundabouts, one on the North Shore, one on the South Shore that eases traffic a little bit more and um, keeps people moving basically. I'm just gonna whip through these so I don't go over my eight minutes. Um, these types of projects where we're doing complete street rehabilitations like on Sierra Boulevard here, where we're doing stormwater infiltration, bike lanes, new pavement resurfacing, we call these multi-benefit projects. This was a big one on Sierra Boulevard that happened last year with Caltrans and the city of South Lake Tahoe. And then finally, I'll talk about what Sharon alluded to in like the record tourism under the pandemic. Um, so this sustainable recreation program really has intertwined with our transportation program where we're really looking at full corridor planning. Two of our biggest and busiest corridors are SR89 around Emerald Bay and SR28 on the Nevada side by San Harbor. Last year, three miles of the bike trail that eventually we want to go all the way around the lake was completed. Um, but high visitor use, over 250,000 pedestrian counts from last year that we um, saw just since it's been built. And so uh, down here on the bottom, you can see the traffic and um, around Emerald Bay, we're releasing a new recreation plan for uh, the Emerald Bay corridor as well. Um, the Sustainable Recreation Group that just formed three years ago um, has been working tirelessly on these plans over the last couple of years. And when the pandemic hit, they really recognized the need for consistent messaging all around Tahoe. Because if you can imagine with half of our watershed being in California and half being in Nevada, different rules, different issues, different hotspots, trying to make one consistent ruling around the basin was impossible. So the best thing you could do is consistent messaging, right? So we were able to develop these, mat, these uh, messages from the Take Care Tahoe campaign, maybe some of you have seen in, um, around Tahoe or in the Bay Area to encourage responsible behavior when people get here. And I think the, the biggest lesson that's come out of here is the collaborative foundation we, have, we had of the Sustainable Recreation Working Group to come together very quickly, help each other on hot spots, talk about different issues they're facing, different policies, different recreation challenges they're facing was really helpful. They continue to meet every week um, and new issues are coming up every week. And so, so I think the future focus really will be how do you continue sustainable recreation management in the future? Ideas that we wouldn't have even brought to the public are now kind of fair game on reservation systems, um, different ways to manage people of capacity of different areas. So I think that conversation will continue into the future after this. So with that, I will call it, I think I'm gonna hit eight minutes, so maybe over. That's a lot, Kim. And uh, given that you have one of the most senior partnerships, it's quite all right if you go over eight minutes. Um, so one of the questions from one of, uh, from Sue is just about the ongoing strategies you're using to build and maintain support with locals as well as tourists. I mean, um, as far as dealing with the sustainable recreation issues and the pressures. How do we keep the private community engaged? Yep. Um, a lot has been through that take care messaging and really trying to um, get one, one message consistently throughout the basin. And then we've held a couple different 
sustainable recreation workshops where we really said, come on, come one, come all. What do you want to see Tahoe to, to what do you want it to look like? No one likes going to Emerald Bay, not being able to park and not being able to see it. So how can we, what is the vision for Emerald Bay? And I think engaging them right from the beginning before we even put out a plan of how we were gonna man, you know, how we're gonna manage anything, it's engaging stakeholders right from the start of what they really want in, a, in their experience. Are you finding that your signage is effective and do you have anticipation of making anything beyond the two you just shared? Um, yes and no. I think, you know, it's all anecdotal, right? If you've, if we're seeing the messaging take effect, but we've seen like, you know, that everybody wears a mask um, billboard. We have seen the increase in mask usage over the last couple of weeks. We have seen all of our partners utilizing it on their social media and on their outreach platforms. So that's been helpful. And I think it is slowly starting to help, but just the amount of people in the basin right now is just um, mind boggling a little bit on trying to reach all of these different user groups. And I think the day user is different than the overnight user and you're trying to target a lot of different groups. So it's really been helping. We actually developed a different, there's a sustainable recreation working group and we also formed a public information officer group of all of those entities just to get consistent messaging every single week. Well, thank you, Kim. I know there'll be chances for more questions. And you know, so much of our early language around stewardship was connecting people to place, right? And then now with COVID, we're seeing, we're seeing the value of open space and natural areas for human health. And I think now we're trying to figure out how to manage for that. And it, it was really, when, when these presentations started coming in, the last one's gonna be from Kevin Wright, and it's gonna be focused on sustainable recreation. And I can see in the chat box too, Gavin's comment about sustainable recreation working groups. So Kevin, I think it's a nice bridge between what Kim is facing in her larger network and what you're doing um, through your sustainable recreation working group. I agree. I think whoever put this together is a genius. So I'll just say that. I really appreciate following Kim because uh, one, they have been a leader in sustainable recreation at a landscape scale for so long and they do so many innovative things. And two, uh, we're sort of wrapping up the first phase of this CalREC work I'm about to present to you, and I reviewed a lot of the sort of final wrap-up draft information while I was uh, sitting on a beach in Tahoe just recently. So it was really fun to actually be there in that space and think about sustainable recreation. I'm going to quickly share this presentation with you all. And... Let's see, I'll do it like this and make it big. So I am a steering committee member for the California Landscape Stewardship Network. And I just want to present an update on this CalREC vision because what this vision does is seek to introduce and explore how sustainable recreation issues can be resolved across the state with cross-jurisdictional collaborative practices. And part of the reason why uh, this work began earlier this year, um, thanks to John Wentworth from the Mammoth Lakes Trails and Public Access Foundation, is because of the California Network's white paper, Advancing Collaboration in California, which basically explored in detail state policy that was supportive of collaborative cross-jurisdictional practices, and then ended with a series of recommendations for how to advance collaboration a step further across the state. So when John and others on his team read that white paper and thought about the challenges that they were facing across the state uh, regarding recreation, um, they decided that it was time for a variety of conversations. And so over a period of the last couple of months, we had five conversations. It's resulting in a draft white paper um, that will basically describe an approach or a vision for how uh, sustainable recreation can be um, supported across the state through these collaborative cross-jurisdictional practices. And that white paper I'll share with you as soon as it's complete, probably in the next week or two. I do also want to say this may be my most uh, visually boring PowerPoint presentation I've ever put together. And I, there's a story behind that I want to share. I, I felt like it was important to share this. Last week, 
I received since college, which is a long time ago for me, my first ever care package for my mom. And it was a little confusing because she only shares care packages with my six-year-old daughter. So I was, I was ecstatic to see what she might have sent me. And when I opened it up, what it was was a stack of pages printed on dot matrix paper from like the 90s. And there was a note inside it and it said, I hope this um, reminds you of the good old days, love mom. And I looked at what was on the paper and it was a bunch of Bible lessons. And I was like, is it the Bible lessons or the dot matrix paper that is supposed to remind me of the good old days? And so I was kind of creating this presentation at the same time and I decided to make it um, kind of really old fashioned and dot matrixy so that you would also be reminded of the good old days just like I was. So with that, I'm gonna jump back in. Um, these are the collaborating advisors that John pulled together from across the state. It includes a couple of network members. Um, he pulled together a great team of consultants as well as facilitators to, again, explore how cross-jurisdictional collaboration can overcome barriers across the state and generally support uh, sustainable recreation practices. So you'll see folks from federal agencies, state agencies, um, a lot of leaders that he hopes will come together over time to address a lot of the challenges that were identified. You also see Dan Smith from Visit California, um, some regional partners. And as we had these discussions, they focus on sustainable recreation through a triple bottom line, um, meaning economic, environmental, and social. And I wanna say that tied to each of these is also equity considerations. The group was very clear that um, within each of these contexts uh, is, is equity and that needs to be at the forefront. Um, so examples, economic development, tourism, public health, access to public lands, natural resources, these are all familiar to you and sort of helped us to define and think about sustainable recreation. There were dozens of different opportunities that um, improving cross-jurisdictional approaches to sustainable recreation could address. And some of these will look familiar because you've either solved or tried to solve some of these in your own regions. Um, a unified or simplified pass system that combines state and federal lands and helps folks not only overcome barriers um, to buying passes, but also encourages uh, dispersed visitation throughout a region. Um, developing and deploying public information campaigns to broadly teach uh, recreation stewardship and um, proper behavior to care for lands that we're recreating on shared data as well as spatial mapping to help land managers not only share data across boundaries to understand where visitors are going and what their behaviors are, but also to shape management at a regional scale based on that data. Um, another example is implementing uh, the Sierra Nevada Conservancy's vibrant recreation tourism strategy um, through partnership agreements with federal and state land managers. So the conversations at a high level really resulted in two areas of focus. One was generally strengthening cross-jurisdictional approaches to help um, sustainable recreation practitioners uh, do their work better across landscapes. And then the second was to explore models of state level leadership. And again, as I mentioned, this is resulting in a white paper, but I wanna be clear, the white paper is really a jumping off point to have more of these discussions across the state that we recognize that within our own network here at the California Landscape Stewardship Network, um, our regional practitioners have been doing a lot of this work already. And I think it was John's intention to actually before COVID do regional workshops across the state and have bigger conversations. And I think, you know, as many of you have said, we scaled it way back to sort of put a framework around this thinking and create a white, white paper to have a discussion, but then as a next step, actually starting right now, to begin to have um, additional, more involved conversations to refine um, what the white paper says and the overall CalRec approach over time. There are a number of intersections, um, just speaking as a steering committee member to the California network, uh, intersections with the California network um, regarding how the network could support sustainable recreation across the state. And these are based on strengths that the California network already has. And the first is um, obviously to gain input on the draft white paper. I'll be sharing that with all of you and uh, with a series of structured questions and I would love to gather input from you and even hold small group conversations. Um, the California network's always been great at providing technical assistance around partnership practices. It's done um, 
it supported research in a variety of areas around capacity building and um, collaborative practices and shared tools and models. Um, so that would be beneficial. Uh, you know, offering the collaborative leadership training program that we're developing to uh, sustainable recreation practitioners um, as an extension of what we offer would be great. Sharing models of successful cross-jurisdictional work, as well as um, strengthening the network of sustainable recreation practitioners. That's really, you know, in the wheelhouse of our network. Um, and then the last two, including support of recommendations in our policy work, uh, which I certainly plan to help with, and then including sustainable recreation among our long-term focus areas. I know over time at our other convenings, we've talked a lot about federal state partnerships and begun to sort of open up those conversations and after listening to the folks, I felt like this is really ripe as an opportunity. And finally, I just wanted to end with uh, three questions that you don't have to answer now, but I just wanted you to ponder and to invite you to get in touch and give me feedback on. The first is what needs or approaches come to mind uh, when you, and actually I can't read my own, uh, I'm going to move my picture myself. What needs or approaches come to mind when you think of supporting sustainable recreation in your area? And then these other two relate. So what are specific examples of successful cross-jurisdictional sustainable recreation work you're aware of? And what are specific sustainable recreation challenges you feel could be resolved by advancing federal state partnerships or other types of cross-jurisdictional efforts? So that I wanna leave you with three um, contacts. One is for me at the top and then Tracy Verardo Torres and John Wentworth were um, the two really key players in this work. And so I share their emails as well and invite you to reach out to those folks with questions or interest in exploring this work together. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, one question that popped up was regarding the definition being used for sustainable recreation. Um, do you want to share, I'd not put you on the spot, but uh, what definition is being used or how you're thinking about the framework? Thanks, actually, we spent time talking about a vision. Uh, we didn't necessarily talk at length about a specific definition and I shared that information about the, um, like the three aspects, the economic, um, the, uh, you know, whatever, it's been a long day. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I feel like what we did was use that as sideboards to think about the work and our challenges and then think about the cross-jurisdictional environment and how to resolve some of those challenges. I mean, it reminds me of our conversations about stewardship, right? It's, we struggle with a definition. We had a much better opportunity to really talk about how we express it and what the dimensions of it are, and what our vision for it was. So I can appreciate that. I think there was general agreement, sorry to, um, interject, but I was just going to say, I, I think folks in the recreation sphere are challenged to communicate why recreation is so critical to focus on and to gain momentum around and why it relates to these other spheres. And I think that was a common conversation. Um, I know that in the environment of COVID, as Shalana and others mentioned, uh, our recreation facilities have become such an important critical thing that basically as the antidote to all the stresses we're feeling, people are going outside. Um, it's also the place where it's the most safe. And so people are going outside for that reason as they're giving up other indoor activities. And um, so it's critically important now. And at the same time, I think there's been a history of, you know, at, at least at the statewide level, struggling to kind of gain momentum around supporting it in certain ways. Well, thank you, and, and uh, thank you for all of the folks who wanted to share something from their region. Just uh, wondering, anyone popcorn style? Anyone have anything to add, highlight, small or big idea that's coming from your region, something you're proud of before we move into small group breakouts? I have one thing, Sharon, and this is maybe just uh, a little bit of woo for the group, but I am struck hearing these updates, um, how quickly everyone has responded to the moment. 
Um, and it's a big moment, right, with layered, layered crises that we're facing. And our sector, conservation, stewardship, public lands, working lands, have really risen to the challenge. And I think we're trying to um, prior reprioritize our work and come together and um, work with partners and co-collaborators co in a really uh, expanded way. And I, I, that gives me hope. Well, thank you, Shalana. I don't know if I'd call that woo. I think that's a, a statement of <laughs> fact. And one of the things we, we've been getting a lot of feedback around the state. And so um, Mike O'Connell, I think he had to jump off, but there's a small group of folks who are going to facilitate a conversation on September 19th, a roundtable on stimulus and social distancing and stewardship and how we're responding operationally to COVID and looking at some of the practices many of us are adopting all around the state and what's working, what's not, what we're adapting and how we're trying to still undertake our stewardship work. So your point's well taken. All right, well, in, in true network fashion, we're gonna try something. We don't know if it's gonna work on that, but that's just who we are because that's how we innovate. Um, and then if you, it's five o'clock somewhere. So anyone knowing it's, you know, many of you are logging up. If you want to pick up a drink, feel free. Um, Devin is going to put together a poll. And what we're thinking of is breaking into small groups by theme. So today it was really great because we heard a different, a suite of different types of conversations, right? Collaborative based, habitat restoration, work that's happening economic stimulus and natural infrastructure, and then this whole conversation about recreation, sustainable recreation. So we thought that we would pick a couple of those categories. You guys could pick a, you know, which one you might be most interested in, and then we would actually do breakout groups regarding where you have your interest. Pretty close to, uh, to almost 5.30, I think, yes. Uh, normally we would facilitate just some high level thoughts, but I wanna be very mindful of time and uh, just thank you for joining us today. It's always hard to recreate what we once knew to be our connection points in a virtual setting. But again, the network is really striving to bring through the summer series, the dimensions of what we normally would be connecting on. So um, I hope that this was fun for you. Um, we didn't get to necessarily do a virtual toast. Maybe that will be the end of the summer series. We're excited by our, October, I mean, our August 10th, um, webinar with a lot of our colleagues that both national and international and then really then speaking to our stewardship sustainability and COVID webinar too in September. So as always please reach out if there's anything you want to share. If there's an idea that you might have uh, we're excited to continue to at least be able to connect in this way and we're welcoming a lot new folks a lot of new folks too so that's a, a positive. Um, so with that any closing thoughts, Devin or Michaela? No? Just All right, thank well, you everyone so much for joining. We really appreciate your time yeah. and sharing and hope to see you again really soon. I, I stuck the uh, link to our next upcoming events in the chat. So hopefully see you there soon. Great, thank yes. you so much. Thanks for those of you that presented. It was great to see you all and talk soon. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks all the presenters. Thanks everyone. See ya.